Hey, everybody, and welcome back to the TSG Bytecast. I'm Steve Tamasoff, and uh, it's good to be back. It's been a long while since I've recorded any episodes. I uh, took a much longer break than I expected after I got back from Queensland and uh, just decided to enjoy the winter and and just uh, take a break from bikes for a little bit. It was quite abrupt, but we're back to do some episodes for the summer series. So for the first episode, I've got a, uh, an old mate of mine named Shannon Rademacher, if you recognize that name. He's the owner of the All Terrain Cycles franchise in uh, High Country, Victoria, uh, Mount Buller, Mansfield, and also a store in Bright. He is also a gravity coach for Gravity Oz, which is another one of his businesses. And more in more recent times, he is the creator and owner of the Highline Mountain Bike Festival, which is uh, pushing Australian slope style in a really, really positive direction. So uh, we're going to talk about all of that. Uh, and many, many other things. Uh, so I hope you enjoyed the episode. I've got a few lined up for the summer. And uh, thanks again for being patient and all the nice messages I've had asking when there's going to be more episodes. So uh, let's get into it. Shannon Rademacher, All Trans Cycles. Here we go. All right, dude. So, uh, all right. So, let's get into it. Um, so, let's go all the way back, man. Where were you born and where'd you grow up? Uh, yeah, going back 40 odd years ago to a small little town called Pakapunyal in the uh, middle of Victoria. Um, so, my old man was in the army. And uh, so, I was born just down the road in a place called Kilmore. So, that's where I started my upbringing is army life. I was just this little army brat, you know. So, growing up there and yeah, little town, there was an army base. It was just basically army families and, you know, there was that army life and you didn't really mix with the city life, as they called it. So mm-hmm. that's uh, where things started for me back in, the, back in the heyday. Yeah, right. What was your dad doing in the army? What was his role? Well, he joined general entry as a lot of uh, young men did back then where there wasn't much work in the 70s and, um, you know, the recessions and stuff back then and, so, yeah, for him and his brothers too, like he's one of four and, and they all pretty much entered the army at, you know, early ages of like 17, 18 years old. And so, yeah, he, he was um, went through his training and ended up being in Pakapunya, which is the first armed regiment. And, um, yeah, pretty much went in as a tanky. Yeah, so, right on. And, uh, yeah, from there, uh, yeah, basically he just went through 20-odd years, nearly 25 years of, um, you know, being in the army. So he just moved up the ranks. He uh, got to, you know, pretty high up in the officer ranks as well uh, before he retired and, you know, got out and then got into the bike industry. So, and, um, you know, he's, he's one of his goals since he was a kid, like he's a, he was a roadie, tracky for, uh, as a kid and, you know, being a Dutch heritage, you know, him and his brothers rode us road and track. And, you know, my opa moved over from, uh, you know, Poland back in the 50s and, you know, started their family and then, yeah, him, uh, they were racing in the Gang Nong uh, Road Cycling Club back then and, you know, racing track and road. And, uh, and yeah, for him, it was like always a goal to, you know, get into the bike industry. And so once he'd done his 20-odd years, he got out and, uh, yeah, bought, a, bought an old shop in Bayswater. And, you know, and that's, you know, how he's, uh, you know, he got to get out of the, the army lifestyle and uh, into the civil life. And, yeah, to still really love bonus is playing with bikes and fixing them and selling them, so. Yeah, nice down in Bayswater. So obviously, like, you know, biking was instilled in you at a young age. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's quite obvious that you love it. Um, so how old were you when you first started to really get serious into it? Yeah, like back in Pakapunyal, like there was a BMX track, you know, and Pakapunyal BMX track was uh, and the club was quite big. So my family, or my mum and dad, and then uh, there were two other families that ran the club back then. And so when I, at the age of six, I got into racing. BMX and um you know I remember still remember this day going to the first meet like before I actually raced and went and watched like back in the early 80s it was going on it was huge like it was just massive like a lot of brands a lot of Australian brands they made their own BMX bikes um people made them in their backyards and yeah and then the park of BMX track was one of the kind of progressive tracks that had a probably I reckon one of the first ever uh, pro lines in a BMX track in the 80s because it was definitely, I remember as a kid, I had to turn off earlier, but the pros went straight over some doubles. And um, it was a super fun track, good times, and that's how I got into the sport um, of racing BMX and just, yeah, through through BMX. And, um, 
Fairfax and traveling around. They used to drive us all over the state, interstate, doing the circuit, going to state titles, going to national championships uh, all through my junior years um, to my teenage years. So, yeah, that's how I got into cycling myself. Yeah, right. It's um, yeah, it's funny because you know mountain biking was definitely in its infancy when we were kids. You know, we we're around the same age. It was definitely all about BMX and uh, rollerblades for me. I was right into that when I was young. But uh, um, yeah, but yeah, it was like riding right, infancy mountain biking. When did you start sort of noticing mountain biking and and having a go at that? As far as the racing went, it was probably the late teens. Like um, I think it was about sixteen or seventeen when I discovered that mountain biking. You know, you can race and there was opportunity and as I moved around as a kid and you know in Darwin you know I was we were close to Darwin and uh after there so there wasn't much of a bike scene up there so I kind of got out of that scene for a bit and got into basketball and played some b-ball and we used to just ride a bike to school and just muck around the bike but when I uh, moved to Geelong actually was when uh I actually got you know found out there's a man bike club the Geelong man bike club and Started doing some XC racing of all things, and like this is cool, love this out of the Yangs. Uh, even a place called Anarchy, and a lot of people probably have been around long enough, probably heard of Anarchy. Uh, there's some downer racing going on there, uh, down at Anglesey, too. You know, it's mm -hmm. still a lot today, but back in the day, there was lots of racing going out to the uh, back of Anglesey there. So, yeah, had my hardtail, you know, just a chrome ollie frame, cantilever brakes, you know, 26 no suspension, and yeah, that's pretty much started on that. And uh, I was like, you know, like any kid in a candy store going to the shops going, oh, look at suspension. Oh, look at the brakes on that. And, you know, duty forks were like, man, that's sick. It's got suspension on it. And <laughs> yeah. you know, that's when to get a new bike. And, um, yeah, so from there, my love for mountain biking grew is, uh, yeah, my late teens. Yeah, right on. It seems for most people around our age, that's sort of, you know, that's when mountain biking was just really starting to gain a little bit of traction you know, still was overtaken by BMX and um, other forms of riding. But um, yeah, just seeing suspension for the first time and and just seeing how far it's come now as like 40-year-olds, it's uh, it's pretty crazy. Oh, it certainly is. Like the evolution of bikes right now has been amazing. Like, you know, every year just gets more exciting as bike development continues. And it just means I can do more. I can have more fun on the bike. It's never boring. And uh, technology's definitely made our, our life and our love for biking just grow and uh, more fun. So yeah, just the bike industry has kept doing what they're doing, really. So absolutely, what we started on to now is uh, phenomenal. So it's been a really cool evolution of the industry and being involved with it. It's been uh, absolutely rad. Yeah, absolutely, man. Um, so talking about the industry yourself, so when did you sort of decide that? Oh shit, I'm going to have a go at you know having a career in the bike industry, whether it be you know what what was your first thoughts? Well, when I left school, like you know, we, well, I guess year twelve, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. I, I nearly went down the path of a carpentry apprenticeship, so you know, I applied for apprenticeship and thought, oh, this is great, and oh, that's what I want to do. I, I kind of had a, a love for working with wood and just through high school and making furniture, and so did my opa, like he used to make furniture and stuff all the time. So, you know, I kind of thought that's where I was going until um, in year twelve, I was doing out to red, and um, we went on this like I wouldn't call it. Back in the day, mountain biking was just riding on a dirt road. And uh, so we went on a school excursion. I'm like, there's this person taking us for a ride. And I'm thinking, oh, that's cool. You can do that as a job. And that sort of sparked my interest from there. And so I asked me out the red teacher. I said, well, where can, how do I learn to become be that guy? You know, How do I become a guide or a coach? And uh, so he pointed me in a few directions and uh, I ended up in Mount Buller. You know, there was a La Trobe Uni and there was an out to red course up there. And so signed on to that. And, Next thing I know, I've moved to Mount Buller and finished school. And, you know, in the thick wear of Mount Buller, for me, I knew about I raced there as a junior and downhill. I've been up there for cross country and school championships in the late 90s. And so I was like, cool. And I love skiing, love the outdoors. So I was like, perfect choice for me. Go up yep. there, study out, become a guide. And um, that's how I got into working in the industry uh, and, you know, striving for a goal and a dream to you know, one day, you know, have my own mountain bike business. And, um, you know, at that point in time, it was kind of like you, there was no pathway. There's no career pathway. You didn't, there was no real kind of direction. There's no mentorship. There's, there's kind of like you can do your guide, go in the, the red world, do your paddling, do your walking, uh, do your rock climbing, get a mountain biking on roads um, as far as work goes. But 
as far as uh, where it's ended up today is just 20 years later it's been um, yeah beyond my what I thought you know things would be going so that's where it all started for me yeah yeah right on because um you, you were pretty early on when you started Gravity Oz right so when when did all that come about and uh, tell us what Gravity Oz is all about yeah so the coaching side you know that was um pretty much well, when I come back from Whistler in 2008 actually so I spent quite a few years racing bikes and uh, traveling a bit just living the dream and then uh, I spent 12 months overseas with my now wife near Ellen you know we had a good time there and worked in the bike park you know and got more of a feel for the coaching world and how you take people out in the park and train them up and take them on tours you know in a different environment and um from there, I got back, you know, poor, like most Aussies in living in Whistler. You come back pretty poor and you're just like, right, I'll either go back to Whistler or do I, you know, look at, you know, doing my, my dream, like of trying to start my own business. And um, so, yeah, there's an opportunity in Mansfield that uh, the original bike shop slash sports shop slash ammo fishing shop was for sale. And um, so I looked at that. I've done a winter in up at Mount Buller, just trying to recoup some money to make some money and keep, keep life going. But And then, yeah, so I ended up buying the shop and um, kind of it just turned into a straight-up bike shop. And from there, it's kind of cool. Well, this is a start. This is how I can start a mountain bike company. So I opened the stores, got a shop front, so ATC or all train cycles. And then from there, I just had a side brand called Gravity Oz. As you know, I wanted to just work on gravity coaching and start from there and, from there, the brand was formed and, you know, was able to just start getting some clientele and uh, just reaching out to industry and people and the race scene that I was involved with and just saying, hey, I'm doing some coaching. Does anyone want to, you know, learn how to ride a bike better or faster? And um, after the training in Whistler, you know, most, most ideas for a lot of the world come from Whistler because either they push the boundaries and they kind of the evolution but. You know, these camps they run, the clinics they run. I'm like, cool, I want to do that here in Australia. And um, But the thing back then, there was no clients. No one knew about it. No one was interested in coaching or getting skills. So uh, so just had to start off slow, be patient, and, um, yeah, just let it grow until the point there was a market and people started just keep, you know, putting it out there and start just trying to sell it, you know, and try and get people out there to say, hey, riding, riding's fun. If you want to have more fun, come and learn how to ride better. Yeah, absolutely, man. Like, um, you know, looking back in, you know, the 2008, 2009, especially with downhill, it was just starting to grow. You know, the likes of Steve Pete, Sam Hill and stuff, all these guys really starting to show what could be done on bikes. And, you know, you, uh, that was before my time. I didn't get into bikes till 2010. So I was 30, 2011 maybe. Yeah, so I was just starting to see these dual suspension bikes come through and start to watch downhill racing. And you could sort certainly see the potential as to where biking could go in Australia at that time. Yeah, it's definitely growing huge. And like, I, I remember coming back from Whistler and, you know, the downhill scene was thriving and, um, you know, went to a few races and just started racing downhill a lot again because I missed the racing. So I was away traveling. And yeah, it's just, uh, it just, and then as we know today, the scene's just growing dramatically. It's tenfold. It's just uh, the Groms are getting into it younger and like, you know, well, the Grons are starting at 10, whereas we started 16, 17, so, you know, or later back then. Um, and back then, downhill racing, there was only a, an under-19s category. There wasn't under-17s, there wasn't under-15s, and it was just a man's sport. There was barely a woman racing back then. And, and uh, yeah, and you look at it now, it's just there's females in every category. There's uh, categories down under-13s and up until Masters. And, yeah, some of our old boys are still pretty fast, so... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah man i was actually i was just chatting to a mate about chris kavarik the other day and uh we're just going man, whenever i see that dude riding still he still just shreds you know it's like it's just yeah yeah so uh, the, what is it they're saying now is uh pro masters it's like uh you know we're still pros it's just the old <laughs> pro racing pros so you know we're just getting older but still still not uh that slower that's for sure yeah yeah that's it man still entertaining racing so like yeah so with the whole mansfield scene where your first shop was so was it when you first opened it was a primarily like road riding scene and fire road like mountain biking or was there already a downhill scene starting to grow yeah so it was um you know 
Yeah, there was a local scene. It was pretty small, like, you know, obviously Buller in the background and, you know, a lot of us went up there to ride. Um, we do have still to this day our secret tracks, you know, in the nearby hills that are still there and entertain us and we build and keep you know, seeing, seeing the life. Um, but, yeah, there's always been that teenagers that are, are riding and there still is today, like, you know, riding mountain bikes and downhill has definitely grown. But back then it was probably just a handful of us, like, you know, there's probably a dozen of us that actually rode mountain bikes back then and it was a very strong road scene, uh, which is still still to this day a road scene in Mansfield. Um, so, yeah, and over time as the industry grew and Bull started investing heavily in trails more, um, Mansfield grew and... As I pushed the scene a lot more in Mansfield, things grew and we got more people into it. And uh, just pro that promotion and trying to generate some energy was, you know, around it because there wasn't really a market there in Mansfield for biking. And I kind of had to just push it hard and try and generate and uh, work with a lot of other operators, other businesses, um, and with Buller, trying to just push things with Buller and trying to grab any kind of market I could back then. So, uh, and then there's a rail trail that got built a couple of years after I'd opened the store. And so I was like, cool, okay, there's another market coming to town. And, you know, those people that love just, you know, it's all about the journey. It's about seeing the sights, you know, dropping, stopping into the small town. So we started to see some growth over time. And uh, obviously with Buller growing with the investment trail, and yeah, we sort of just grew with that, with that uh, movement. So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, when did you open the shop in Buller? It was it was pretty new when I first started hanging around those parts, I think. Yeah, like two years later, like uh, I opened the store in Mansfield. And then um, what I, I still remember, uh, I was just saying to someone the other day how that started, like I used to drive up there with a trailer of about 10 bikes and just sit in the car park and just hope to God someone was going to hire a bike. You know, I had a repair stand and some tools and some spare parts. Um uh, yeah, sorry for the dropout there. Uh, Shannon was in Threbo at that time when we were recording and it was a pretty wild weather. If you remember just recently, there was a lot of snow and uh, he was up there doing some skills clinics up there and uh, yeah, couldn't get those done. And unfortunately, the uh, uh, the internet dropped out, but we uh, we cut back in and uh, we continued on with our conversation. I thought we stayed connected now, mate. Yeah, it's all right, uh, mate. It's all good. Yeah, I was talking about yeah the, day, uh, the days of me sitting on Bolo with a bike trailer, you know, had some GT bikes back then. I had like, you know, good old GT Force and uh, some DHIs and sat just in the car park, just hoping to buy some bikes. And uh, I kind of started from there for the first season. And then um, the, the second season after that, uh, got to know some people around the mountain and, you know, found myself a, a ski shop. And the uh, the owner of that's like, hey, I'm happy to lease this out to you, you know, just rather than be out in the elements and have a proper shop and since then it just you know, we've been in that location ever since in the village square and uh yeah it's been a really great great move and just same just growing with the industry growing with the momentum of buller and uh still to this day you know we're still open every day we've had challenges along the way and uh you know we've obviously COVID, bushfires um just lulls in history obviously other bike destinations popping up so the spread of the mountain bike market was pretty thin you know as every destination's fighting for a piece of the market so but yeah look ball is now in a position where it's you know got some recurve trail and some excitement and um some energy behind it so i'm looking forward to the next the future of Buller, that's for sure yeah absolutely mate it was great to see when um i was actually sitting down chatting to ryan delarue um, not long before he announced that he was coming up to Buller to do some rebuilds with his new business. And um, I was pretty excited to see what him and Evan had come up with. And I didn't get to come up last summer, but uh, what everyone was saying is that it's just been, it's just like this whole big refreshment of uh, all those old trails that we've loved for years and ridden. And now it's just been given this new life, which is so rad to hear. Certainly is like, you know, been there and been riding there for over 20 years and, to see the change and the evolution of the trails is 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 awesome because for, for me, like I'm probably their number one customer, right? I've been there forever. I've seen the growth and I want to ride there more. But you know what they've done now is reinvested my interest in the place. So at personally as a rider, um, just to go and have fun there again, you know. So especially like the Altai Trail, it's one of the most iconic tracks on the town. It's always been a fire road style, just fun adventure track, but. Wait till you see the shapes, mate. Like the shapes that Evan uh, Ryan put on there. Yeah, it's going to be the biggest giant flow track in Australia. 
Yeah, awesome. I can't wait to ride it, man. Ryan, when I spoke to him, was pretty excited about it too. So I'm uh yeah, I'm stoked to check it out soon, hopefully. Yeah, so so sick. So um you also were involved um with PMBI a lot. Uh, when did you start doing your PMBI accreditations? Yeah, so I first actually got involved with, as far as them doing me jumping on the course, I should say. So with um back in the day we met a few mates who were just like out to readies and we're like we're looking for a, a qualification, just something to kind of maybe clarify what we were doing with our coaching or in the outdoor world. Uh, with our tools and guiding. So I pulled together a bunch of crew and friends that are in the world and we got over um, Paul from PBIA out of Canada and uh, to Mount Buller. And um, yeah, it ended up being the three three days of awesome learning, but three of the shittest weather we could ever imagine. But, uh, you know, <laughs> typical our point. Um, we just went, wow, this is amazing. Like, this is it's got great structure, it's great content, and it works. And so... From there, I was just using it like anybody else that went on the course, just went back to my business, started using it and coaching, and I'm like, wow, this this really works. So um, just get very confidence-inspiring and to see instant results with the clients at the time. So, yeah, sort of went, and from there, I was like, cool, I had this thirst to learn more and um, from them, and they, were, they have these level two courses that you can go and do, learn how to teach higher advanced riders, and so I went and jumped on one of those. And then, um, you know, they were looking for more people to run courses. And I'm like, hey, this could be cool. Like, I'm definitely keen. It's a passion and interest of mine. And um, so, yeah, I asked the question and they said, sure, let's train you up. And and uh, so, yeah, I got trained up. And within a year, I was running some level one courses in Australia. And, um, yeah, just love it. I just love teaching, educating people and um, just making the industry more professional as well. Just trying to educate Firstly, instructors and potential coaches to go, hey, this is how we do it. This is contact. This is safe. It's fun. And this is the best way to progress riders. Um, and yeah, just for, for the riders themselves to get good education. Like, you don't, you know, there's, there's, what I was doing before was okay, but just, you know, before I got to it, the method of PBI way and obviously the, the structure and content and terminologies, um, because before there wasn't really anyone telling you how to do it. We kind of just guessed, right? We just go with what we all kind of figured how to ride a bike. Um, and then, yeah, from there, I just started running courses and got into it more. And for me personally, it was it was a career path. For the first time in a long time, I saw there's a path for me to learn, to become this more than just a coach, but also to train people and professionalise our industry uh, in Australia. And that was in line with PMBI's um, philosophy as well, is just trying to professionalise the industry and give people opportunity as a career path in this industry to become a coach. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so our, our, our synergies are there. And yeah, so still to this day, still involved with those guys. And um, I've moved up you know, the chain quite a lot as far as running. Now I run level two courses. Uh, I'm mentoring the new wave of uh, uh, MBI course conductors in Australia. So we've trained up in the last 12 months new course conductors. Um, so I've moved up in as far as a mentor role and still developing myself as a course conductor and as a coach. So you can never stop learning. Oh, absolutely. And, um, uh, but yeah, it, it's now become a global recognized system and a course that, you know, um, and the reason why it's happened is because it, it works and, and uh, it's believable. So. Yeah, absolutely, man. I did my level one PMBI in like, I think it was 2017 at Threadbow. Um, with a few mates and we had um, Reese Ellis, you know, bike park manager at Medina. He was the, he was the course leader for that. And um, even just what I took out of that course over those three days, like myself and my few friends, when we we're driving home, we're just like, shit, man, I just actually picked up a few riding tips there about cornering and a few things that I just didn't really think of. And I implemented that into teaching all the kids that I was helping out over that next summer, you know, and it's uh, sometimes, yeah, always learning. Right. That's right. Like, there's a lot of people that come on these courses just for PD, and then there's others who actually want to go and coach or help the club out or help out another uh, coaching business. But that's the thing you can never stop learning as a rider, and that's the fun part of this sport. And you know, and why we do it is because every little bit of information helps with our riding, and the more knowledge we have, the more fun we can ride and apply to our skills. And you know, I'm still applying little things every day and every week, and every time I teach a course or do a coaching, I'm like. 
oh, okay, I'm going to add that to my writing or if someone asks a question and it makes you think in a way to then tell them how to do it. Um, and then you start to articulate that information into your own writing. So, yeah, it's, um, you know, you've, you've been through it and you can see the benefit and, and that's quite a common result from the courses now is people just walk away, not just as a coach, but just go, man, I can, I'm, I know what I'm doing on the bike now. I can have more fun. Mm -hmm. so, exactly. Really, and that's what I love about the industry and people uh, just have more fun on the bike. That's why we do it, right? We don't have to ride bikes, but we do it because it's fun. Yeah, exactly. And if you can make a career out of it, man, like, you know, we're at a point in the industry now, you know, we're both doing it. I mean, you've had these businesses for ages and, and I'm just living my nice little quiet mountain biker's life out here in the hills. And yeah, I never would have thought I could be able to do this for a living, you know, 10, 15 years ago, for sure. Well, that's right. I mean, yeah, you, you can have a career out of this industry as well. And there's so many little, little arms now that, you know, it's not just, you know, bike shops anymore it's you know it's trail building it's coaching it's tours it's um shuttles it's events and you know trail maintenance and everything it's so much and magazines and media so it's generated you know this massive branch of our industry now that is you know a job in every pocket that you know everyone can enjoy so and the, the culture Unreal, as you know, man. It's just this, this vibe and culture of mountain biking is uh, absolutely what we love about. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely, man. So, um, as your as your stores grew and everything, you decided to open one in Bright as well. So, um. I remember when that place opened, I was just finishing up my time at World Trail and, um, yeah, I heard you were coming to Bright. What sort of spurred that moment? I mean, it's quite obvious, really, because, you know, Mystic's an awesome bike park, but what really put that thought process into your head to get cracking forwards? Uh, there was one bloke who was just nagging me for a long time, a really good mate of mine, and you probably know him, Nick. Um, yeah. And uh, he used to be a mental guy and he moved to Bright and he's like, for years, was like, Shane, you got to open a store in Bright. And I'm like, nah, man, I've got enough. I can't do it. And then he just kept chipping away at me. And then um, at the time, I was working for a TAFE system. I was teaching people in the TAFE system as well how to become mountain bike guides. And I was there for a week in Bright running a five-day course for the TAFE. And um, he's like, Shan, there's a shop here. It's got There's a lease. Come and have a look. And I'm like, no, nah, don't, don't do it. And, uh, <laughs> So, you know, he got the better of me. He's like, no, nah, come have a look, mate. It's great. It's great. And so, anyway, we had a look, peeking through the window at night, looking through, just like, okay, it's pretty small. Okay, it looks all right. It needs a bit of work. Um, so, yeah, I called, called the uh, landlord and just said, what's the go, mate? What's the deal? Anyway, I was like, okay, that's kind of cool. And I was like, leases in Bright don't come up all that often. They're very hard. And it was the same year the Hero Trail had announced funding and they were going to build a new track. And um, I was like, okay, this this could work. I mean, there's, there, was, there was growth. There was a lot of commercial push. The right high country type branding was really pushing hard in, you know, our neck of the woods. And and I was like, bugger it. I was uh, let's make it happen. So, um, yeah, pretty much within, a, I think, about a two-month window, we turned around and opened up a store in late 2015 and and uh yeah it was definitely a hard one because you know there was a pretty impactful uh thing happened in my life just as, just after i opened the store and um uh yeah <laughs> i to talk about but um yeah with my old man but yeah certainly opened the store and it's um yeah since then it grew and uh just yeah the same deal lucky that bright just grew mystic bike park biking became more and more prevalent as a commercial product in Bright. And, um, yeah, just been pretty fortunate to get in there at the right time and uh, to grow with that space as well. So um, very lucky to have you yeah, good staff over the years who have helped drive that. And, you know, especially in the first few years of that store opening where I was MIA, um, just dealing with, you know, grief and stuff. And mm -hmm. so yeah, certainly a... Um, and now it's pretty exciting, you know. As you know, Bright's amazing. It's a fun place and we love it, you know. You know I've, I could move there in a heartbeat, but I'm pretty well established in Mansfield, so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I hear you, man. Like, I remember when you're open and having, like, Phil and Maddie there, you know, and, um, you know, it's just it just became our bike shop 
to go to all the time. And knowing that with Phil, you're always just going to get an honest, um, an honest reception. He's always going to be honest with you all the time. And I think that helped a lot with the reputation that that ATC got so early and bright that Phil was just this heartwarming, happy Canadian dude that had just dropped everything to help everyone. And he's always in the amongst the community, same as Maddie. They just love ride, love and lived and breathed riding, you know. And I think it was pretty. You picked up two awesome guys there to start off with. Yeah, sure did. Like I had to hunt high and low for staff, and it's still hard to find good staff today. And Maddie's still there, spattering away for us. And he, I, I, I admire him the best of times because I'm like, how are you still living the dream of you know just he's older than us and he's just yeah. living and riding faster than us and he's just living the dream in bride. And I'm like, sometimes I, I. I envy him, and then uh, yeah, Phil was a legend for you know the time, and then yeah, he made a career change, and he's now got a wife and kid, and wanted to settle down, and yeah, he lived and breathed the bike industry more than I did in some ways too. So, so yeah, that's the thing. Like for me, I've been super lucky with the you know you're only as good as a team around you, and you know and underneath you know, to be fortunate to have good staff like that throughout uh, my my business side career and. Um, you know, some of my guys in Bright, I'm oh, sorry, Mansfield, they're still there today, 10 years on. So, you know, it's good to have them to stick around. They obviously love the job. And like, you know, most people, you know, if they're passionate and keen and you look after them, then, um, yeah, you're going to get the best out of them. Yeah, absolutely, man. You know, it's just always growing out there. Um, so, you, you've, man, you've been involved in so much community stuff. Just from writing this episode, I was looking at so much um so you've got you know you've got your wife and you've got four daughters as well so you got a a, a tribe of girls yeah. and uh and they all love to ride it's it's obviously you know it's all just instilled in the family just like it was for you as a kid how do the how do the girls love it look yeah they they're definitely into it like i don't push it it's just organic um i don't want to force them into competing or anything so for us and it's for me i'm having some of the best riding moments with my kids um you know other outside of racing or just normal riding with mates and i've had some very special moments over the years with my girls just riding and seeing their sense of achievement and fun on the bike and i've definitely learned a lot about you know kids development but also just how kids the simple fun of life like mm -hmm. all the things that kids just like you know taking riding on a pedal bike for the first time off a balance bike um you know riding down some tech technical terrain and taking my kids down the Della type for the first time or you know we were in Beechworth the other week you know we thought everywhere is wet it's miserable what's dry what's rideable and we went to Beechworth and they hadn't been there before and we had a ball you know and those moments in life with your kids that uh, you always cherish forever and to share a passion with them is um yeah you can't it doesn't it beats everything it just uh puts a big smile on my face every time and yeah. So yeah, I love it. My wife's amazing. She, you know, I'm away at the moment, and you know, I'm always away working, and she's just amazing and looks after our our girls. So um, yeah, she's definitely, you know, the champion uh, <laughs> in our household when it comes to that, and and bringing up our girls, uh, be our beautiful girls. So yeah, very happy, very lucky to have you know four beautiful girls as well. And um, yeah, we had a pretty amazing trip in Canada recently, and you know, to be able to ride a-line with them you know my older two um was definitely one of the biggest highlights of my life to, to be able to send it down a-line with them so yeah, yeah sweet so what spurred the trip to canada because um when we were sort of speaking earlier yeah you were saying you you just got back from canada what sort of spurred that trip oh uh, it's been a lot like i love canada like a lot of us do um been back you know over the years you know going for riding trips or you know going going to learn more how to coach and like i've done a few coaching trips before but this one, this one was more about my wife and I. We love Canada and we've got a lot of friends and a base there. But it was more about us as a family connecting deeper because obviously the last three or four years and uh, it's been pretty tough on a lot of us. And, you know, work has been hectic as well and I haven't been home much. So it was that carrot that dangled for many years for us. And we had a goal many years ago. I said, well, this is the year that we're going to go and do it. And we saved and worked hard towards this goal of, be able to have a trip with our kids to Canada and just enjoy life for a few months. So it was definitely just a, a goal we achieved to, you know, have quality family time where we can ride bikes. Um, we can chill out, hang out in an environment that's, you know, a really cool environment, you know, in Whistler, uh, catch up with old friends, meet new friends, uh, and just create new experiences. So 
we it was just more than what we got. Um, we got so lucky in many ways through a house uh, connections and just hookups and things like that. Um, but, um, just lived our best life for two months. So, um, yeah, I just saw my girls, got to learn more about them, uh, spent some quality time with the wife as well and, yeah, just give back to them and uh, all the time that I've been working my ass off, uh, yeah, over the years, so. Yeah, yeah. oh, man, sounds pretty terrible. <laughs> to be honest, dude. But it's definitely recommended to anybody. Like, it, <laughs> save the big ones to the goals and do it, like, just getting away from your own environment is the best thing you can do for and staying put. So because some holidays, like, you know, you can just go from town to town or destination to destination. It just gets busy and hectic, but it was sort of like a home away from home. Yeah, absolutely, man. Now that's, that's really awesome. So um, there's a few other things I wanted to chat about. Um, one of the big ones as well uh, is Highline Bike Festival. It's um we've watched slope style in Australia slowly simmering away, but it hasn't really had that real push. But uh, there's been a few events around they've been doing, and yeah, and you guys are throwing your hats in the ring as well to try and push slope style in Australia really far forwards. Um, so how what's your involvement with Highline, and how did all this begin? Um, uh, so yeah, it's just another big kind of big idea I had um years ago. So and then I was like, oh, I want to. To push this scene just another thing for me that i was like i want to push this area of the mountain bike industry in australia that hasn't been done before so back in 2018 um i said to Mount i said look is there any chance i can put some jumps on the toboggan slope you know and um there was some building going on on mount buller and there was a lot of excess dirt getting around so I spoke to the construction side and got permission from mount buller and they said yeah sure let's they wanted to develop the toboggan slope too and have expand the area. So it was definitely on their radar. So uh, all our kind of, you know, it worked with, well for them, worked for me. And so we put, did a jam, just basically did a, a slope jam on at Buller, uh, the opening weekends, 2018, I think it was. So of the season and it was fun. It was awesome. We just got, just reached out to a heap of the slope crew and, um, yeah, they all come down. We all had a ball. So from there, it was born. And then we created a, a brand. So young fellow, Galen Slaney, who's worked for me for a very long time. He's you know, in the mix of all that slope world. And he's always, you know, I've always heard him and listened to him. Like his dream was to go and compete um, in slope style. And so part of my motivation is like, here's this young guy. I want to achieve a dream and a goal. And, you know, I'm like, well, cool. For me, that's like a motivator to grow that side of sport like I've seen it in Whistler I've watched Crankworks many many times I've watched F&B events over the years and I'm like man Australia needs this I'm like you know what I'm going to be that person to drive this and push that forward in this, in, in this country so so I went out on a limb you know investing my own time and money into it and um, so yeah then the following well, it's still that season we created an F&B event uh, to coincide with the what was then the Bike Buller Festival. So we built a slightly bigger course, got it sanctioned by F&B, and next minute we're now I'm holding a, an F&B sanctioned uh, slope style event. So, uh, and then we officially called it Highline from there. It just, uh, the momentum just exploded from that point onwards. Um, so yeah, from there, we just planned for next year at Buller, at the Bike Buller Festival, and then for the Bike Buller Festival event managers, they were like, this is sick, this is a great addition to the mountain, so did Buller, this is amazing. Um, so yeah, the dirt itself got pushed back into the Tobogan slope for the winter, and then we're like, cool, I need more dirt, but we couldn't dig it up again. Uh, and then that year, they were building a dam up on Buller, so there was all this dirt getting around, so Buller was, uh, you know, we got the Dirt shipped down for all the landings. I put in my wooden ramps, built a nice flat drop, and then we just had a slightly bigger course and ran another F and B bronze event. Um, we had more riders turn up. We had some international riders turn up, and bigger crowd. So, you know, the momentum was uh, definitely flowing then too. So, uh, and from there it became a, you know, okay, cool. Where do we go from here? And obviously the challenge of the bullet was we couldn't get any more dirt or dig it up. Um, so we looked at options in Mount Buller and we just couldn't find a way to do it in Mount Buller anymore. So from there, I just had to look at other areas, zones, land, parks. 
because um, slope courses are pretty expensive to build. So mm -hmm. um, I wanted somewhere where I didn't have to rebuild every year. And so yeah, I reached out to a lot of people I knew had land in Mansfield um, and where it ended up was on friends' land that we had our own private dental tracks on for many years. And so yeah, I got chatting to, to them and yeah, they're like sick, we love it. Love your idea. We want to grow with it. Let's do it. So we um, formalized an agreement and and, a, and away it went. And fortunately enough, COVID um, gave me enough time to sit in a digger and just build. And um, so just over COVID, just build, build, build. And um, next minute we're um, yeah, put on a bigger course, a permanent course, and uh, did another bronze event. And uh Put a downhill race, so I tied in a downhill race with it just to bring some atmosphere, had a whip off. And um, yeah, next minute Highline Festival's born uh, from that point onwards. And then this year we ran our first silver event, so next level up, which is a pretty big, you know, next level. There's a bit more investment involved. Um, it, it appeals to more international riders, uh, but I'll push this year. The borders were shut, so we missed out on, you know, about a dozen international riders attending. But mm. next year, 2023 it's going to go off and so yeah we've just been building the product um pushing that scene growing it and yeah people love it and that's kind of where you know people look at crankworks or they look at that world and they're like how do i get there australians just don't know how to get there so um, same deal just developing a pathway to create opportunity for riders and to get to that to that level so by competing doing training programs so we held a women's Free ride momentum camp earlier this year, you know, with Caroline Buchanan and Haz, and you know, because they're really passionate about driving the women's free ride movement. Uh, I've started running some slope style coaching and, and um, development camps as well up there, and it's five minutes from my house, so for me, it's nice and close to home. And so, yeah, just growing that free ride world, giving people a chance to race dual slalom, get into the sport of um, or discipline of speed style, which is something new and fun. Uh, and yeah, amateur slope style and as well as pro slope style. And uh, yeah, I'm just, that's just grown. So it's, uh, I've created this beast that, you know, I didn't think it was going to go this big, but, you know, once again, passion, driven, motivation, uh, you know, it, it's all there. And I just want to keep growing it and pushing this industry, this side of the industry, because I've done most other things. And, um, yeah. I want to see that grow and give those riders, and especially Galen, who still works for me now, and like you know my right hand man in this, he he helps me with ideas, or like I feed off him, or say ask him a question, what do you think about this, what do you think about this, because he's in the mix of those players, and you know he gives me a lot of feedback, and then hey, what's happening here, and yeah, it's really cool to see him grow and achieve goals and dreams, and you know, it makes me stoked just to be able to supply that, you know, for not just him but for everybody. So. Yeah. Yeah, right on, man. It's um, I didn't get to go last oh this year because I was away in Queensland, but I'm definitely planning to come to the next one. I love how just watching it, how much it's grown, and it's pretty much become a pathway to Crankworks. You're starting to incorporate all these events that everyone can at least get in and try speed style and and all this. It's um, yeah, it's pretty cool to see in Australia, and I think it's like very long overdue, and I'm glad someone is doing it. So good on you, man. That's so rad. I appreciate it, man. Look, for me, I just love this industry. It's what's in my blood, as we've said. Like, I, just love, I, I love a challenge, I love a risk, and I just love developing this this world of, that we love, you know. And, you know, I've got a lot to offer, and I just want to keep offering as much as I can while I can, and I've, you know, been around long enough to, to do it. And like, and so like I said, just take a risk, invest my own money into it, and um, which has pretty much been a lot of people don't realise. They think it's bigger than it is, uh, but at the end of the day, it's just me. You know, I've built the courses, I've, I've managed the events, I pull in the people, organise everything, do all the planning, the marketing, the whole lot. So, you know, for me, it's, um, I love it. It's exciting, you know, building a product. So, uh, yeah, obviously the team's growing next year. I've got some more people coming on board because I'm like, got to a point where, no, I can't do this myself anymore. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I bet, dude. Yeah, no, that's so cool. We're, yeah, every, we talk about it a lot out here. We're all looking forward to seeing where you take it next year, and um, we're all definitely going to be there to check it out, that's for sure. I'm stoked, man. It'd be cool to have you there and, yeah, just be part of the environment and the culture. Yeah, absolutely, man. Yeah. So the next thing I want to do something you did just uh, recently, and we'll finish up soon. Um, you went up to Crankworks as well in Cairns. It was, how sick is it that we finally got one in Australia? Um, yeah, 
so sick, man. Like, oh, yeah. Like, obviously, Australia, like, you know, good timing for Australia with the Crankworks. Um, I was stoked to, yeah, get get an invite from Crankworks to, hey, we want you to come work for us. And um, they loved, obviously, what I've been doing because uh, the Crankworks and F&B are, you know, two in, two in one. And they're like, we need you. You're the only guy who's got this experience. And so we want you to come and work for us at the first Crankworks in Australia. And I was like, stoked, yeah, I'm there. So very stoked to get appointed, you know, chief of slope style, they call it, um, you know, to manage the main event. Uh, and then, yeah, help out. We had a pretty cool team. We had another guy, Bob Morris, who's an event legend. Uh, we had another guy, um, Kelvin, who was in Whistler and worked for Crankworks back then, but now resides in Brisbane. But the three of us who were kind of in control of the slope zone, so speed style, whip off and pump track and dual slalom. So we all had our roles and we all worked together. And it's just an amazing experience. I think the euphoria of it all, just like this is the first one in Australia uh, on Aussie soil, you know, Brand new courses built, which were just incredibly built by three trail building companies, really like World Trail, Elevate, and Flux. Like what they shaped was just oh, jaw dropping. Like you know, when you see the imagery before going up, I, oh, I was excited, but when I stood there in the slope zone, man, it was just beautiful. It's just beautiful look out. So um, pretty, pretty good stoke came out of that. I learned a lot just working with that team, um, an amazing team with the events crew on the ground and the, event, and the Crankworks crew. And uh, yeah, definitely. And they're like, cool, we'll see you back next year. So uh, Crankworks is back up in uh, Cairns in May. So looking sure forward to it already. Yeah, yeah, I'm definitely going to go to that one as well. Um, like, I just, when I heard that like Remy Morton was going to be involved in World Trail and Elevate, I was just like, man, what? they're going to build something just pretty off the wall. We all know what Remy Morton's building and riding styles like and elevator, just like known just slope style masters when it comes to, to design. Um, just watching what they, what everyone's been doing this year for the whole Crankworks world tour slope styles just move forward all of a sudden, even the riders are saying that it's challenging them and it's like giving them this whole new sort of, you know, it's refreshing almost. And they're just pulling these monster tricks off. Now it's getting pretty insane. Oh, it sure is. Like, those courses are so fun and the riders just listening to the riders on course like they're like we've never ridden anything like this everything's just perfectly built um just there the right feedback and just seeing the pleasure of crank works like aussie's been able to race in dual slalom speed style do the whip off uh and obviously the downhill race that went with it as well and there's some pretty good results from the aussie crew so just that for them to be there and, and for the trail builders to do that on Australian soil. Uh, yeah, I know Glenn, that was pretty stoked. And I had a lot to do with Tom because he's put Tom at Elevate was the main builder for the slope style. So him and I had to a big relationship of tweaking courses, managing the course, make sure it was safe. We had to, to adjust a few lips and things here and there as well. So, you know, he, he's a legend, like got to know him well. And uh, just, yeah, he, he just knows how to shape. Like he's just got this eye for detail. And his work ethic was just what they him and his boys did was just out of this world to reshape one of the um the first lips into the dirt pipe, you know, you know, in a critical moment was they got it done in an instant. And then the flux boys at Remy and Dave McMillan, like, you know, their eye for how the speed and shape, like they nailed it. Those courses, like sometimes it takes two or three versions to get them right, but they nailed it on the first go. Like yep. yeah. Racing was exciting to watch. It was, man. I really enjoyed watching it. Um, you know, it's good to see the old downhill track getting used again. I worked on that thing way back in the day in like 2013 and 14, man. <laughs> it's great to see it being used and televised again. Yeah, it was definitely uh I got to ride it in practice, like I wanted feedback and just make sure everything was kosher with the track and the and the commissaires. And like I, I hadn't ridden it before, to be honest. And I was like, this is a crazy ass track and you know for it to be there since 96 like you know and it's still there like it's pretty pretty good history of australian mountain biking right there so. yeah absolutely like i remember when we were walking at the first time and glenn was just walking with us going okay we're gonna change this to this we're gonna change this to this next thing reese reese atkinson's building whoops down in a section and we're building all these new booters and it was just like we hand cut this line through the vines and 
just like, oh, okay, here we go. This is going to be interesting. And then it rained. Yeah. <laughs> rained and turned to peanut butter. And that, yeah. was, that was the worst nightmare if, if, for cans like Crankworks. Our worst nightmare would have been too much rain and peanut butter. Yeah. You know? And we got light dusting each night. It was kind of like the guys were just like, we're just going to keep the dust down. And it just like just settled everything and helped the trails just settle for good competition. So, yeah, yeah the downhill track is uh, pretty exciting. Definitely had its thrills and spills. Um, so, uh, I think it's uh, it's created more of a reputation in that track than ever. <laughs> I think so as well, man. Well, dude, we've come to uh, we've come to the end of it. We've gotten through the list for for this one. Um, so the last thing I always ask at the end of every episode is, what's next for Shannon? What's what are your plans, mate? Ooh, what's next? Uh, gee, I'd love to retire, but um, <laughs> too much to do. What's next? Try my my goal right now is a like everyone probably most goals is a work life balance. Um, but work smarter, not harder, is probably the biggest thing. But yeah, just continue to push and grow the industry is probably what I'm going to continue to do uh, mm-hmm. from here. Just keep doing what I'm doing, do what I love. Um, Keep educating, keep training, keep evolving, provide opportunities for the industry. Um, yeah, I don't think I'll stop until the day I die, to be honest. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, just keep having fun. Ride my bike and have fun. That's all I can say. That's it, man. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, look what you've been doing anyway. You know, you know, I've been living out in these hills for pretty much 10 years now. And it's, um, yeah, it's amazing how far I've seen it all come and, and same as yourself, you know, we've got this pretty thriving industry out here now and you've been a part of it. And uh, yeah, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show, man. No, I appreciate you uh, inviting me on because you know, I mean, it's the first time. So I appreciate you getting me into the podcast world. So yeah, yeah, too easy, man. So where can people follow along uh, what you're up to, what All Terrain's doing, uh, Highline Festival, if people don't know what that is, if they've been living under a rock? <laughs> Uh, yeah, t- typical channels, websites, highlinemtd.com.au or uh, the alltraincycles.com.au if you want shops, bike shop repairs, sales, hire tours. Uh, all the socials are the same handle. So, um, yeah, they can jump on there and find what I'm up to and what my crew are up to. So, um, yeah, look forward to seeing them and yourself, mate, at, uh, at any you know, upcoming events and uh, around the traps. And we should go for a ride. Yeah, I think we should, mate. Absolutely. It's, uh, yeah, well, I can't ride at falls at the moment. I'm looking at we're all looking to go riding everywhere else at the moment. So it's going to be it's going to be a big summer, hopefully. Uh, hit me up, and I'll hit you up if I'm in your, your neck of the woods. And uh, yeah, let's go ride. Do it, absolutely, man. Cheers for your time. You're welcome. Thanks. All right, so that's it for the uh, first episode of the summer series. I uh, hope you enjoyed our uh, Shan's story. Um, like he said, you can follow along our Highline Mountain Bike Festival on Instagram and also All Terrain Cycles. Um, and you can follow me at the TSG Bikecast on Instagram and also on YouTube. You can see our beautiful faces on my channel, That Stoked Guy. And that uh, video should release the same day that this episode has dropped also. So, uh, yeah, thanks a lot. I'm stoked to be back. I uh, hope everyone has a great summer and is uh, dusting off their bikes and getting ready to go shredly. Have fun. Have fun.